The United Nations was created in 1945. It is the temple of diplomacy that's in charge of maintaining world peace. Ethics and transparency are considered key values. However, this old and noble institution is now in turmoil. John Ash, the former president of the UN General Assembly, has received over a million euros in bribes. He was one of the closest collaborators of the UN Secretary General, the South Korean Ban Ki-moon, leading the organization for 10 years. Today, the UN is shaken by a series of scandals. The reputation of the organization is damaged by cases of corruption, trafficking and waste of public money. Part of the money was also supposed to go to the head of the mission. I heard that 12 million euros were to go to him. People are greedy and always will be. Unfortunately, greed rules the UN. Some are raising their concerns internally to accuse the United Nations of covering up its crimes. An anonymous UN executive even created a Muppet show to denounce the Omerta ruled by the Secretary General of the organization. Ban Ki moon often speaks of zero tolerance, meaning he's got zero tolerance for anyone trying to tarnish the image that he wanted to create. Is corruption leading the UN? Is the global police able to clean up its own mess? And do they really want to? The UN is a multinational humanitarian organization that works almost like a company. We rarely think about it, but maintaining peace on the planet requires a lot of logistics planning. We are going to southern Lebanon, to an area controlled by Hezbollah, the Shiite terrorist organization. Hezbollah was created about 30 years ago and regularly challenges Israel with rockets. The Israeli army has attacked southern Lebanon several times. Since 1978, the UN interim force in Lebanon, UNIFIL, has been trying every day to re-establish the authority of Lebanon in this scattered region. So Syria is over there, behind the mountains, and this is Israel. We are in a sensitive area. The peacekeeping mission of the UN in Lebanon aims to secure the borders with Israel following the various wars. So they work on calming things down. UNIFIL is made up of 10,000 peacekeepers. 900 of them are French. One third of the patrol will be on 16th Road, uh, Suson Road, Victor Charlie 16 and Victor Charlie 12. In the event of a rocket fire, if the launch is being prepared, we intervene with the Falcons in the zone. If the shooting has taken place, we leave the area as quickly as possible to avoid an Israeli response. UNIFIL is not just about plans of battles or heavily armed activists on the ground. There are also a lot of logistics involved. These soldiers must be fed and housed. To do this, the UN calls on thousands of suppliers. Tons of equipment arrive every week, by boat or by convoy. Goods are sent by private companies that have contracts with the United Nations. The logistics manager shows us the expenditure items. Refueling with gas, for example. Who's providing the gas there? It is a civil society that is under contract with the UN. Was it the UN that provided gas? Exactly. 
To supply its camps in Lebanon, the United Nations issued a tender and concluded a three-year contract of 68 million euros with an oil company based in Beirut. Okay. A UN base also requires houses that are often prefabricated, like these. An Italian company named Coramex supplies them. Here is an example room. All the soldiers on the force stay in a place like this. So this one's for two people. But three or even four people can sleep here by adding furniture. What is this type of housing called? These are commonly called Coramex. It is a brand of hard housing that is sometimes found in other theatres. The latest UN order for this company was 6 million euros worth of prefabricated buildings. To feed their men, and they also have to provide tons of food every week. The food comes from Beirut but can be imported from other countries, right? Yes, by boat or plane. From all over the world? It's from all over the world. Yogurts, for example, are from Croatia. Meat and charcuterie are from Spain. In general, it's from Croatia and Spain. What is that? Cheese, Gouda. Is it a must? Definitely. They eat a lot of cheese. The food is provided by a company based in Kuwait, a contract worth 53 million euros for three years. In costs of food, transport, materials, and expenses of the team, the UN interim force in Lebanon works with a total budget of 448 million euros per year. The United Nations has 16 missions like this one around the world with colossal budgets. In Kosovo, for example, the United Nations spends 35 million euros each year. In Darfur, an area of Sudan, they spend 1 billion euros per year to secure the region after a civil war and genocide. Even in Haiti, the United Nations invests 340 million euros every year to stabilize the country. For the maintenance of peace alone, the UN has an annual budget of 7 billion euros, financed by its member states, therefore by taxpayers, from all over the world. France contributes in up to 500 million euros per year. These huge amounts are managed in the UN headquarters in New York. particularly in the procurement office. Contracts with more than 20,000 suppliers are signed in here. The director is a Ukrainian who rarely gives interviews. We only have 15 minutes for this meeting. According to him, public money is well managed. The basic, the basic principle of purchasing in the UN is to seek the best value for money. We don't buy the cheapest nor the most expensive. We look for a happy medium. We study the market, make the offer accordingly, and we treat everyone honestly and transparently. That is how we try to work. Fantastic! The UN would impose a very strict code of conduct on its suppliers. The United Nations expects their suppliers to strive to surpass the best international practices and those in their sector of activity. And when it comes to corruption... The United Nations expects their suppliers to comply with the highest moral and ethical standards. To remind them of the rules, the procurement office regularly asks suppliers to attend seminars. We did not have permission to film one of them, but we were able to recover these photos from 2015. They organize conferences to detail the needs of the United Nations and meetings before signing contracts.
During our shoot in New York, one of these seminars is taking place in this cultural center. At the end of the day, we met with one of the suppliers. Hello. Hello. He represents a Belgian agri-food company. Is there anything you could tell us? Yes, it was the first day. It lasts for two days. So there are conferences, appointments, as well as face-to-face -face meetings with buyers from the United Nations for various services. It is not easy to provide them. And the speech that the United Nations gave him is that the suppliers must be irreproachable. Are you able to invite someone out for an evening dinner to build a relationship? No, they made it clear to us that it is forbidden. They did not explicitly say that it was forbidden, but they implied it. They did it in a joking way, saying that they did not have time to go out for dinner with thousands of suppliers. But I think that this kind of method is forbidden, as it is with any tender. So it's very supervised? Yes, it is very regulated. Entrepreneurs are warned. Breaking the rules is out of the question. Otherwise, the UN will put them on a blacklist of suppliers that are prohibited from contracting. As the organization operates with public money, they pride themselves on spending their sums rigorously and transparently. But are they always careful about the companies they work with? In Haiti in 2010, a huge scandal revealed the shortcomings of the UN. The consequences were dramatic for this country that is already struggling to recover from an earthquake that occurred a few months earlier. At the time, MINUSTA, the UN mission, employed 13,000 peacekeepers on site to manage the wastewater in their camp, the United Nations mandates Senko, a local company. We are going to the center of the country, 50 kilometers from the capital to Mirbalé. In this peacekeeper camp that is now abandoned, Senko was supposed to treat wastewater. But instead of sanitizing the water properly in a sewage treatment plant, due to economic reasons, the Haitian company dumped it into the wild every week. Then they just sprayed it with disinfectants. This small-scale farmer lives a few meters away from the pit where the wastewater was dumped. For months, he lived in a foul-smelling atmosphere. There's the bathroom. They were emptying the toilet there. Which company was it? It was Sanko. When the truck came, they emptied the tank into the hole and left. Was there a lid on the pit? No, there wasn't. So it was in the open then? Yes, as you can see. The droppings could pass through the grass and go into the nearby river. With the rain, the feces contaminated the water in the river that flows just below. A river that feeds one of the main waterways in Haiti, one that the population used to wash, cook and drink. The problem is that in this camp, some of the Nepalese peacekeepers carried a virus, cholera, that has spread across the country. In October 2010, an unprecedented epidemic exploded in Haiti. Cholera had disappeared from the island a century ago. So the victims fell sick one after the other and died in just a few hours. In three years, the epidemic caused nearly 9,000 deaths. Mm. 
Several scientific studies, including academic reports, demonstrate that the cholera epidemic in Haiti was directly linked to the peacekeepers in the Minusta. UN experts recognized in a report on the cholera outbreak that the wastewater treatment at the Mirabalé camp was inadequate. Even today, the consequences of the epidemic are heavy for thousands of families devastated by cholera. Like Sede, 51 years old, and his daughter Clermita, 8 years old. Hello? How are you? Can I sit here? Yes. When my family members had cholera, they were unable to walk. People had to carry them. They couldn't stand. They were vomiting and had diarrhea. They were unable to recognize anyone anymore. They lost all their mental stability, all their common sense. So have you lost loved ones? I lost my mother because of it. She was taken to the hospital. The roads here are not good. We carried her on our backs. When we got to the hospital, she died within an hour. The death of my mother really hurt me. I am very upset. My daughter is sick. So I am really, really upset. Clermita survived the cholera, but she will have lifelong consequences. What do you expect from the UN? I filed a complaint against them for my daughter. She is a victim. I am waiting for them to compensate us because this has severely impacted our lives. A lawyer helped me to write a letter and sent it to Ban Ki-moon. But we never got a response. 2,000 Haitians, like this father, have been waiting for several months to get a response from Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General. After the cholera scandal, did the UN sanction Sanko? We contacted the Haitian company, but were told that they do not respond to the press. So we went to meet these drivers with a hidden camera. Our translator managed to convince one of them to talk to us. Hello, how are you? Was the company punished by the minister right after the cholera outbreak? No, not at all. Sanko worked with minister before the outbreak and continued to work for minister after the cholera outbreak took place. Did you change your behavior in terms of service recently with Sanko? No, we didn't change anything. Even after the outbreak, nothing changed at all? No. After the cholera epidemic, the United Nations continued to sign contracts with Sanko. The proof is these contract award documents. For example, in August 2012, the organization commissioned the company for $424,000, nearly 370,000 euros. Hey, my family's been a contractor for the UN for a long time. We do a lot of business together. Between 2010 and 2014, the UN has awarded nearly 1 million euros in new contracts to Sanko. How is a company that's involved in a health scandal that caused 9,000 deaths able to continue working for the UN? We are going back to ask the question in New York to the service that is supposed to be monitoring business practices, the procurement office. Its director does not like to point out the contradictions of the UN. Why do you still work with the company called Sanko, involved in the cholera epidemic in Haiti? The cholera in Haiti. As far as I can recall, Sanko was removed from the list of UN suppliers a long time ago. Because there were contracts in 2012, 2013, 2014. 
At the United Nations, there is a global purchasing department and a local purchasing department. In Haiti, it was the administration of the Ministar. The Sanko case was managed locally. It was a local contract. From the moment when their breaches were reported to me, we audited the company and it was rejected by New York. But as you can imagine, we have tens of thousands of suppliers of the United Nations and thousands of local contracts. I can't tell you since I can't remotely know what's going on in Haiti or Côte d'Ivoire unless Haiti or Côte d'Ivoire or any other mission report it to me. And they didn't tell you about it? I don't know. It was a local contract. The UN headquarters in New York clearly doesn't know what the UN does in the rest of the world. So maybe the procurement division needs to spend a couple of bucks on a dictionary. Most thrift shops will sell you a dictionary for two dollars. Just make sure you get one that includes the word accountability. The particularity of the United Nations is that they are not accountable to anyone. The UN benefits from what is called immunity. Regardless of its shortcomings, it cannot be condemned by a national court. However, some lawyers are contesting this immunity. They are American and Haitian. They represent 5,000 cholera victims. In 2013, they filed a complaint before the American courts. They are coming out of a hearing. The UN people cannot plead that they did not carry the cholera. They know it. They cannot argue that they shouldn't compensate the victims. They know it. The only legal remedy is immunity. If it was lifted, they could be asked to pay for their mistakes. Lifting this immunity would be the only way to get compensation for the victims. And as a lawyer, would you say it's much harder to deal with them than it is to compete against a private company? Yes, it is much more difficult. And it's ironic because the United Nations is an organization that was created to promote human rights. But in Haiti, there were 9,000 deaths. Human rights were violated. So for the first time, this immunity could be lifted. The verdict will come at the end of September 2016. At the UN, moral values are trampled upon every day. Public money is often squandered or even misappropriated. UN employees and managers across the world have spoken to us. Their testimonies are terrifying. Waste, corruption, trafficking. In Haiti, for example, wasting money is said to be common. Tammy, an American police officer, was able to see this in 2012. She was employed by a subcontractor to train Haitian police officers under the mandate of the United Nations. She dreamed of being a humanitarian, but she was quickly disenchanted. She is back today in St. Louis, Missouri, her hometown. So you were training the Haitian police? No, not really, but we were supposed to do it. They called it coaching, monitoring, but it wasn't really coaching. I almost never saw the Haitian police, except for one time I saw police officers in a car, and then I took a photo. So what did you do with your days? I spent all day on the computer playing on the internet, and then I went outside and played dominoes with the Jordanian peacekeepers. That's about it. I reported to my contingent commander that we were not doing anything. He told me that it was our mission and that this is just the way the mission is. To do nothing? Yes, unfortunately. How much were you paid? I was paid over 100,000 euros per year. My company paid half and the UN paid the other half. So it was a big waste of money? A huge waste of money. And this example is not the only one. In Darfur, the UN employs 20,000 people and will squander millions of euros per year. We were able to reach a UN official who is working on site. He regrets the irresponsibility of his colleagues. 80% of the people in the mission don't even work. 
They don't even have an idea why they're there. I feel horrible when I see the money paid by the member states and all those millions that are not spent in the right way. And what are the biggest wastes of money you would have? I think the biggest waste is in the way that they use air assets. A lot of my colleagues use helicopters, like taxis sometimes. They take them to see the other teams with only one or two people on board. Without thinking about the fact that each trip costs an average of 12,000 euros. Fantastic! What's even worse is that some UN missions are plagued by trafficking. For example, in Liberia, where peacekeepers allegedly sold stolen equipment to the black market. This is what an ancient UN officer who became a press correspondent at the headquarters tells us. I wanted to buy a laptop and someone said to me, look, the Nigerian police are coming back from vacation and I know some have a few for sale. Were they police officers or peacekeepers? Policemen under the UN flag are peacekeepers. So I went to the international police station. It was mind-blowing, truly. There were lots of cell phones and computers everywhere to choose from. And do peacekeepers do that often? Oh, yes, yes, sure, yes. Of course. Trafficking was on such a shocking scale that sometimes it deprived the local population of basic necessities. What bothered me was the rise of the World Food Program that arrived in bulk containers. And very few of them actually went to the displacement camp. I saw it on the markets. It was sold on the markets, medication too. Resold by whom? By the UN people who were supposed to monitor the situation on the port. They were the ones responsible for the distribution. I thought it was amazing. And when I asked questions, there was no answer. Fantastic. More than trafficking, there are often thefts, as in the mission in Haiti. This is what a former employee, who worked for the UN for three years in the warehouses, discovered. They robbed companies, warehouses, solar panels, batteries, hard drives. And yet there are cameras and men are guarding. Yeah, absolutely. They're all there. You never know who it is in the end, and no one is ever punished? No. According to her, UN employees involved in these robberies tried to buy her silence. Someone told me you directly use the money you receive for your son's college, and when your envelope arrives, all you have to do is to cooperate. Just cooperate. Was it corruption? Of course it was corruption, but as a Christian, I told him, look, I'm blind, I can't see. I am mute. I can't speak, and I can't hear either. They trusted me and talked to me about everything. Also in Haiti, some UN staff officials went too far, asking for money from candidates for the job. We have an appointment with a Haitian witness who was working for the minister for six years. Within the minister, people gave up their salaries to come and work. To get a job? Yes. And what did they tell them they had to pay for? The team's money. And sometimes racketeering even happened every month. I have a friend who works there. He was asked, to donate an amount each time his salary was paid. Did he have to pay back a part of his salary? Yes. To whom? To his superior. He did not accept that. As a result, he was put aside. 
Was he fired? Yes. And it is a practice that was never denounced? No. How come? There's no work. The country is going through tough times, so they have no other choice. Can these problems of racketeering, corruption and massive waste be ignored by United Nations officials? We discussed these topics with the director of the procurement office. But apparently, it's a very sensitive issue. Can we be 100% sure that there will never be corruption? No. The procurement service will always be risky. It will always require attention. The temptations are too strong and we have to work on them. I would like to understand why sometimes there are problems. No, no, and no. What other questions do you have? You know, I want to hear all of them before I continue on camera. I have one last question. It's about waste, and it's a general question. About the waste of money in Darfur, where people say that a lot of containers were lost and that millions of euros were wasted. How do you tackle this problem? That would be the last question. So you're doing an investigation? Goodbye. Chris, take them downstairs. It's impossible to ask these questions. However, the problems we are talking about are not new. In 2005, a huge case of corruption had shaken the United Nations. This could be the biggest scandal the UN has ever seen. These revelations will stain the global reputation of the UN and its Secretary General, Kofi Annan. Oil for food. The scandal that is shaking the UN was revealed by a small Iraqi newspaper. After the invasion of Kuwait in 1990, the UN had put Iraq under embargo, but this sanction starved the Iraqis. Six years later, the UN is once again allowing Iraq to sell its oil to feed its population. It's the oil for food program. But several billion euros were embezzled by people close to Saddam Hussein, thanks to United Nations officials. After this scandal, in 2006, the UN said they would clean up the mess. They created an anti-corruption force, led by a US federal prosecutor. Hello? Hello, nice to meet you. Bob Appleton takes the credit of not coming from the UN Seraglio. I didn't expect to find everything I found. 47 UN suppliers were blacklisted as a result of our investigations. See what we found. Two heads of the procurement department had been bribed by suppliers, two of the oldest in the service. Two chiefs out of how many? Out of three. So does that mean only one boss was honest? Yes, it's crazy. Procurement department managers favored businesses in exchange for generous bribes. They gave them tips. They told them when a contract was going to be awarded. So they were organizing meetings in secret places to give them information? It was out of sight. They didn't use their email addresses. They were too clever for that. So, for example, they were organizing meetings in a hotel room. They were setting up their headquarters and they were changing the tender pages, but they made mistakes. Bob Appleton discovered 20 cases of large-scale corruption. A senior UN official was even sentenced to prison. But today, the organization still seems to be plagued at the highest level. The proof is the latest scandal. In 2013, the Caribbean John Ash was president of the General Assembly, one of the most important positions in the United Nations. 
In October 2015, he was arrested in New York on suspicion of getting more than 1 million euros in bribes from Chinese businessmen. And that is disgraceful. At the time, American justice launched an investigation. This federal prosecutor reveals the corruption pattern. The first group of individuals is suspected of bribing to promote commercial interests at the United Nations, particularly for a multi-billion euro conference center in Macau. And others are suspected of seeking to promote Chinese interests in Antigua. John Ash even went too far by inviting the corruptors to the headquarters in New York to promote their interests. This Chinese-American woman named Sherry Yan was leading a foundation for sustainable developments and was warmly received at the UN and organized forums and galas. Also, this Chinese billionaire had the privilege of being introduced to Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General. Did Ban Ki-moon know about the corruption of one of his closest collaborators? Since we were unable to interview the Secretary General in person, we spoke to his spokesperson during the daily press briefing. This man suddenly became a bit hesitant. There will soon be convictions in the John Ash case. How do you explain that such corruption could develop to such a level at the UN? In what case? John Ash. We are looking at what kind of impact this can have on the system. We are doing an audit on the various groups involved and we hope that it will be done quickly so that we can see exactly what involvement they had in United Nations operations. This audit was finalized in March 2016 and timidly recognized that more transparency is needed at the UN. John Ash died in June 2016, a few months before being tried. He would have faced up to three years in prison. Some of these corrupt officials are defended just a few blocks away by a certain man who chose to be the UN black sheep specialist. His name is Arkady Bouk. He's a lawyer, originally from Azerbaijan. People are eager and always will be. Unfortunately, Greed rules the UN, people are arrested, new people are coming, and the number of arrests, as far as I know, is still more or less the same every year. I think that the level of corruption, of insider trading, of violations of various financial rules and embezzlement is always the same. So why do you think corruption is so pervasive at the UN? Well, I mean, the main problem is the UN money. It belongs to everyone. And when money belongs to everyone, it doesn't belong to anyone. And that leaves the door open to embezzlement. All this corruption will continue. Maybe in a century, the situation will change. I have job security for the rest of my life. Why is the UN unable to stop corruption? And besides, does it really want to? According to Bob Appleton, Ban Ki-moon has no real desire for change. After three years of activity, its anti-corruption force was abolished. Officially, due to lack of budget. Why do you think the anti-corruption force was dismantled? Because we did our job. It's because of what we found. We didn't want to bury or hide anything. We reported what we discovered. We 
We believed that what we were doing was the right thing. But I think that the UN didn't consider it loyal, when for us it was totally loyal. We just wanted to clean up the institution and help it get rid of corrupt personnel and corrupt businesses. And how did Ban Ki-moon react? He no longer wanted me in this position. He didn't fire me, but he didn't renew my contract. If he really wanted to clean up, he would have renewed my contract. And to see there's no result, to all of that is really a huge disappointment. Before leaving, he published reports on corruption cases in Afghanistan, Ethiopia and Iraq. They all went unheeded. We don't want no investigators poking around. We has commercial secrets to protect. Let me remind you, ladies, our deal is that when anybody snitches, you say that complaint is a management issue and you don't do no investigating. Uh-uh. Yeah. To track corruption within the UN, now there is only one team. The Office of Internal Oversight Services, the OIOS. But it is ineffective. It was established in 1994 and has 325 employees around the world. This department can be filmed, but its managers are difficult to access. We were supposed to have an interview with the United Nations Investigation Office, but I just received an email saying that they are cancelling the interview for no reason. In Paris, a UN investigator who has just left this service has agreed to meet with us. When Peter Gallo joined the OIOS, he realized that it was impossible to do his job properly. That is how the OIOS wants us to conduct an investigation. The interviewer should write down all questions in advance. Call the witness and ask only those questions. Then write down the answers. It is very difficult to put together a case. You can't let the person speak freely. The worst part is when someone reveals something to you, as it sometimes happens, and you want to follow the trail, but it's not a part of the plan. It wasn't planned in advance. But if you only ask questions that are planned in advance, you're not really investigating. Yes, that's what I think. All you do is follow the protocol to the letter, and that in itself is the problem. The UN believes that everything can be reduced to protocol. So, according to you, the OIOS office exists only to give the impression that the UN is investigating and tracking corruption. How can I put this? The sheer willpower and enthusiasm that the UN investigators have to do things inefficiently by maximizing bureaucratic procedures in contrast to the reluctance they have while looking for crimes raises some very serious questions. Are the investigators really effective? No. Are they really looking for corruption? I don't think so. Investigators are plagued by bureaucracy and cases are buried. Each year, the Internal Control Office only identifies an average of three cases of corruption in the world. OIOS is conducting the investigation? Nobody thinks it's an investigation. They think it's the biggest stitch-up since Kim Kardashian tore her knickers. And what is most cynical at the UN is that those who reveal malpractices, the whistleblowers, are often punished. We went to Washington to meet a man whose terrible history is also the one of Omerta at the United Nations. 
The American James Wasserstrom worked for the UN for 28 years. In 2007, while he was in office in Kosovo, he discovered a vast system of bribes during a tender. I started to hear that one of the candidate companies had promised bribes if they won the deal. It was about 10% of the contract, or around 350 million euros. And who benefited from these bribes? According to my information, they were people who were close to the Kosovo Minister of Energy. But commissions also went to United Nations officials, in particular to the head of the mission. I heard that 12 million euros would go to him. This really worried me. Because those officials were also in charge of maintaining the order within the mission. So it was impossible for me to go see the UN police in Kosovo, precisely because it was one of the services that depended on them. So James denounced said corruption at the headquarters in New York. His life was about to turn into hell. A few weeks later, as he was about to take off from Kosovo to see his family in Greece, he was stopped at the airport by the United Nations police. They told me, we have a search warrant. I told them, it's not possible, I have immunity. This must be taken care of by the dedicated department. They assured me that everything was in order. It was a lie. The UN police escorted me. A police officer sat next to me while I was driving. A police car was following us in the direction of the capital, Pristina. They stopped in the middle of the town. The flashing lights were on to make a big public show, to make it even more visible and more humiliating. Then they went to my apartment and searched everywhere. So they treated you like a criminal? Yes, like a criminal. Here is the news. Whistleblower protection in the UN has been officially confirmed to be a joke. Posters with his photo are hung up on all local United Nations agencies in Kosovo. He is forbidden from entering the buildings. His office is under seal. Uh, even in my worst nightmares, I would never have imagined this. It was so unthinkable, considering I worked for 28 years at the UN in such a sensitive sector. It had never happened. Even to people who are guilty of crimes, UN officials did not even want to see the evidence of what I was reporting because they had already decided the case. The verdict was already decided on. They didn't want to see me in Kosovo anymore. They wanted to fire me. I was interfering in their networks, in their small worlds. They wanted me to leave and they were going to use any pretext to do that. James not only got himself fired from the United Nations, but he also became a persona non grata in all international organizations. To someone who joined the UN for its ideals and who spent his entire career there, to be tossed out like trash is devastating. It had a serious impact on me, not only financially, but also psychologically. There is no doubt about that. It was a very painful time for me. I really had to fight to try to protect my life and my family. In 2008, James Wasserstrom was appealed to the UN Tribunal, but he only got 13,000 euros in compensation. Much less than his lost retirement as a United Nations employee. Those responsible, whom he denounced, were not sanctioned. Today, the law of silence and impunity still seem to reign in the UN even for the most serious abuses. Tammy Fisher is also a whistleblower. She has also suffered reprisals. This time, it was not about money. She reported sexual crimes. In Haiti in 2012, she used her free time to help the population by also taking actions for pregnant women. As she grew close with Haitians, 
she established closer relationships. Some of them confided in her. One day, a few Haitians came to tell me that my team leader and two African peacemakers sexually exploited women in the camp. They said that even young girls were involved. It was unbelievable. I was so shocked. Were they people you knew? Yes. So I called another American, a coordinator. She was above the team leader, and I told her what was happening. At the time, scandals had already broken out around rapes committed by peacekeepers in Haiti and other countries. In the camps where Tammy worked, there are UN posters that urge employees to denounce sexual abuse. An instruction was also officially relayed by the American subcontractor who employed her. So quite naturally, she talked to her superiors about it. But surprisingly, they did not support her. I received an email from them, sent to the entire contingent. They told us that if we reported another case of sexual exploitation, or if another sexual offense was committed, we would all be going home. What did that mean? It meant, shut up, I guess. Temi has reported several cases of sexual abuse. Her employer decided to fire her. The UN did not react. For the past 10 years, around the world, the United Nations has only officially recognized 700 cases of sexual abuse involving its staff. But how much did the organization cover up? Waste, corruption, rape? Why does the global police pay so little attention to the offenses and crimes committed within? In 2017, the new Secretary General will take office. Will Ban Ki-moon's replacement finally clean up the United Nations? Oh, tune in next week. We'll have another lecture on ethics. <laughs>